Our speaker for the 1030 hour is Ed Benish. Uh, if you want his long name, it's Edward. Uh, he is currently the minister for the Pinellas Park Church of Christ in Pinellas Park, Florida. Uh, and that, if you're not quite sure where Pinellas Park is, think the Tampa Bay area, St. Petersburg. So yes, um, Ed's coming to us from a, you know, a, at least a couple of hours away, right? Uh, he and his wife, Carrie, who made the trip with him, uh, uh, been working with that congregation at Pinellas Park for the last 17 years. Uh, Ed is a 1992 graduate of Fried Hardeman University with a bachelor's degree and then uh, sometime after that, he went through the West Virginia School of Preaching, I think back in about 2000. Uh, he is also a United States Air Force veteran. Uh, he is also a high school mathematics and religion teacher. And he is the father of three adult children. And then I learned last night that Frank Higginbotham, Steve's dad, uh, had the privilege of marrying, um, or at least performing the ceremony with, with Ed and Carrie, uh, you know, a few, uh, several years ago. Uh, Ed is going to be addressing the, it's in the, the series of things that divide us, and this is the, the topic of wounding my brother's conscience, that idea of Christian liberty and, and how we are to treat one another in that context. Ed. <clears throat> well, we're off to a good start. Whoa. There we go. I say that and that happens. We're off to a good start. At least Jacob got my name right. Uh, it is Benish. Uh, I've been at uh, Pinellas Park for 17 years and they still can't get my name right. They still pronounce it Benesh, and I tell them every single time, what is that, the French pronunciation? Uh, but they still don't seem to get it. But uh, anyhow, we're off to a good start. We got our name right, uh, and we're uh, going to dive right into the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I will tell you this, that when I first got the assignment, and I turned to that chapter, and I started reading it, and I realized that it was 13 verses of the not eating meats offered to idols chapter, I turned inward, and there waiting for me was this teenage boy, rolling his eyes and saying, God, why me? This is one of those chapters that, for some reason, is just somewhat difficult to approach. And I don't think it's difficult to approach for the reason that we sometimes think it is. I think it's difficult to approach because when we really dig into it, and we really start examining the chapter the more we begin to realize that it is going to be challenging for me on an individual effort, an individual level, I should say. Uh, and I'm going to have to make some individual effort in order to not only understand the chapter, but to actually put the things into practice. And so when I got the eye roll from the teenage boy, I went to the 54-year-old Ed. And of course, this 54 thing just happened to me last week. But for the last two months, my wife has been reminding me that we have these things in Florida called 55 and older communities. And that I'm one year away from being able to go and live in the 55 year and older community. Which of course has this somewhat of a stigma attached to it. Uh, there's all these no's. No pets, no kids, no this know that. So it's where the uh, carmudgeons go to die, right? Uh, and so I'm one year away from that, and she's reminding me, and I don't want to hear what that guy has to say. So I flee somewhere to the middle ground, and the answer that I come up with for the lesson is what you're going to hear today. At first, I thought about talking about the string of doctrines and possibilities that would fall into the categories of eating meat things that are going to be conceived, or, or not conceived, but perceived as 
um, essential, non-essential, matters of opinion, matters of faith, doctrinal issues, theological issues versus those things that uh, are simply unessential and perhaps not really even worthy of our consideration. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I'm not going to do that. Simply because we, number one, we don't have that context that they had. The last time I checked, uh, you know, we don't have the whole, you know, offering me to idols thing happening. And, and then the more I thought about that, the more I thought, well, you know, this could apply to any number of scenarios, and it is perhaps designed to be kind of presented on a personal level. So I abandoned that whole idea, and I, I moved into this other working outline. And now the reason I'm telling you this is because I think we have to do somewhat of a slow walk up to get to the real point that Paul is trying to tell us here. And sometimes it's really nice and easy for us to kind of stay on the surface of an issue and talk about it because getting below the surface is going to be somewhat of a painful thing for us. And so my next working outline had to do with look how God takes sin so seriously. And we realize that as you go through the chapter and you read it, it starts off with this conversation about knowledge and knowing things. But at the end of the conversation, it's all about these two guys, these two brothers in Christ, and both of them end up in sin. One's called weaker, and by that, the other is assumed to be the stronger, but both of them are in this boat that is called sin at the end of the story. And so, look how serious God is about sin. He, number one, provides for us the knowledge of not only what sin is, but how we can keep from it. He provides us this wonderful thing called the Bible. Second of all, going along with that, he gives us minds in order to process, process that. I can pick up the Bible, I can read it, I can understand it. I can know what it means. And then I can put it into practice in my life. God is concerned about sin. And he wants me to know about its dangers. And so he provides for me this book. And he gives me the means by which I can read this book and come to understand it. But it's not just that, is it? He also provides for me brethren who will love me and encourage me. And of course, that's where the story kind of breaks down when we're looking at it from that perspective. But he also gives me this thing called a conscience. This little voice that's inside of me. This mechanism that when I try to give it definition, when I try to put it under my thumb as far as meaning goes, is somewhat elusive. I do realize that it's something that is within me and it's part of my intellect and it's something that I have to train and it's something that can be trained in a wrong way and it's something can, that can be trained in a good way, but it's something that must be trained nonetheless. But God gives it to me to tell me when I'm messing it up, Ed, you're messing it up. And so God cares about me, and he cares about me staying away from this thing called sin so much that he gives me the word, he gives me a family, he gives me this conscience. But then he gets down to even this level where I'm making choices. I have these rights and I have these freedoms. I have these things that I can choose, but you see, not all of them are going to lead to places where I need to be. Not all of them are going to lead other people to places where they need to be. And so, when it comes to my freedom, he gives me instruction. Don't use that freedom to lead you and other people into sin. That's how much God cares about sin and its influence on my life. See, that was my original working out. And I like that outline, but I didn't think it really addressed what we wanted to address here. And so I retooled for the third time, and I came up with the outline that I'm about to give you. 
It's an outline that has more to do with faith. Because I think the story that Paul is trying to tell us, the picture that Paul is trying to paint for us, the message that Paul is trying to get across to us is not just about the theology of something. It's, it's not just about how much God cares about something. Do we not know that God cares for us? Do we not understand that he sent his only begotten son? We know all that, don't we? But there's a failure here. And it's on the human side of things. And it all has to do with the faith that we have and the faith that we exercise and the balance that we have within the context of that faith. All of us understand that without faith it is impossible to please God. All of us likewise understand that Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so when we turn over to places like 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we begin to, to read, and it says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And anyone who imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. The backdrop of this, as far as our faith is concerned, is the idea of knowledge. We've come to know God by picking up his word and reading. Knowledge is important in the scripture. It's the thing that we find from the very beginning. Going all the way back to those trees that are there in the garden, right? God gives them instruction. He tells them, look, you have a choice. You have this choice that is set before you. You're here in this garden created by God himself. And you have this intimate relationship with him, but... You can choose to do the will of God, that is that life, from that tree of life, or you can choose to do your own will, and that's the thing that's going to bring the consequence to you, that tree of knowledge of good and evil, the choosing of your will over the reality that God has designed for you. You can choose to be deluded, you can choose to not accept the reality of who you are, made in the image of God, and you can move your life forward from there, living out that delusion, or you can embrace true knowledge. You can embrace who you are in him. And of course, we know how that story goes. And we know that from that point on, God sets about this course of bringing his people along giving them the, the knowledge and the understanding that they need in order to one day embrace that salvation that he's going to send them. How important is knowledge? How important is truth in the biblical narrative? Well, it's ultimately important, right? You know, faith comes by hearing the word of God. We've already mentioned that one. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth, buy the truth and sell it not. And that's just a few. You can go back to the psalmist and you can talk about the, you know, the truth of God's word and what good it does for our life. It is that lamp unto my feet, it is the light unto my path. Everywhere we turn within scripture, we have this picture of truth. Now how important is it? To know this truth. Well, it's very important. But we know that. We know that. And of course, we know that even when it comes to the practical things of life. Carrie and I lived in San Antonio for a while when I was with the United States Air Force. And it's so hot there. If you've ever been to San Antonio, you realize it's hot. I mean, it's hot where we are now in Florida, but it is hot in San Antonio. And so they have outdoor parks and playgrounds, but there's nobody there. <laughs> Nobody goes to those. I don't even know why they build them. Everybody goes to the indoor ones, like uh, at uh, McDonald's or something like that. And so one day, after a Sunday morning service, I believe it was, we and another couple from uh, church uh, that we worship with there went to one of these playgrounds. And we got the food, and we got to the playground, and Carrie had to go to the bathroom. She went off to the bathroom. I went into the playground, set the food down, and our son, Max at the time, Wanted to get right in there and get, dive into the balls, right? No interest in the food, dive right into the ball pit. And so I went with him. And 
so in the meantime, Carrie comes back in, sits down, starts eating. Max and I see her, we come out of the ball pit, he's playing, laughing, and we come out and there she is eating somebody else's food. And I'm like, what are you doing? Some you having some fries. Yeah, somebody else's fries. See, truth. Even down to the basic chicken nugget and fry level is something we need to strive for. Scripture's clear about it. The scripture is plain uh, about it. But Paul, when he talks about it, he talks about the truth as, as something that, while it is enlightening, has a dangerous quality to it as well. And it has nothing to do with the truth in and of itself. It has to do with what we do with the truth. If you go back and you read that second verse, it says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. And all that I've read about this passage it says basically this. That the first uh, word know there is a word that kind of means you've reached a state of being, of knowing. You've known and you now stand in the state of being, of knowing. You've taken the deep dive into knowing this something. Now the something here is about idols and it's about meat offered to idols. And so there are people there, a segment of Christians in Corinth, and they've done the deep dive. They wanted the knowledge. But then once they had that knowledge... They started using it in inappropriate ways. And it was causing some of the other brethren to violate their consciences and to sin to the point where they might even go back into the practice of this worshiping of idol idols or idolatry. One of the things that we have to know about Corinth is that it was literally steeped in idolatry. One of the brothers last night pointed out that Corinth was a vile and wicked place. And it was true, but much of why it was a vile and wicked place revolved around the idolatry that they had. The sexual perversion usually revolved around the idolatry that was there and the practices that they had. It's so inundating in this society that it's really hard for us to understand. Uh, hard for us to understand exactly how pervasive this problem was within the Corinthian culture. I, I mean, if meats offered to idols is put into a modern setting, it it's, uh, you know, Starbucks, right? One on every corner. It was everywhere. You couldn't get away from it. It's not just in some temple somewhere. They were selling it in marketplaces. But it wasn't just in marketplaces. It was at parties in people's homes, birthday parties, anniversary parties, victory parties. It was everywhere. We're just going to get together and have a good time. They might have meat offered to idols. And some people lived in that for a long, long time. Every year, <clears throat> one of the things that the Pinellas Park congregation does is go to Mexico and build homes. They're not huge homes, they're not mansions, but they're homes to help uh, those folks out and to support the church that's there in uh, El Zarillo, a little town outside of Ensenada on the Baja Peninsula. And one of the things that you have to do when you're in Mexico every year is wear a hat. Wear a hat. There's a reason why, you know, when you, you talk about Mexican culture, there's almost always a hat involved because it is hotter there. I mean, San Antonio is hot. It's hotter in Florida, but it's even hotter in Mexico, and you've got to wear a hat. First year we went, one of our team members said, ah, I ain't wearing no hat. Yeah, he paid for it for two days. Not good. So you wear a hat, and you wear that hat all day, and you learn by day one that you don't take it off because it's hot, and the sun beats down, and it's closer to you than typically it is anywhere else that you go. So at the end of the day, you go home and you take that hat off. Now, maybe you've done this before. You take that hat off, you put the hat aside, but does the hat go away? No. For the next few hours, and maybe even till the next morning, it feels like you're still wearing that hat. Well, that's kind of the way this is. I know that's a very mundane example, and I don't mean to make light of it. 
But let me give you another. There was a guy that I helped to, you know, or at least I was involved in his conversion. God, of course, is the one that's working in the hearts of mankind. When we first uh, started preaching, I worked in a place called Chillicothe, Ohio. And this guy was a member of the Disciples of Christ, right? Remember the Disciples of Christ. And the biggest difference between Disciples of Christ and, of course, the Christian church and churches of Christ is how they approach the worship. And he was converted, became a member of our church, and he worshiped with us for several years. And then one day he came to me and he confided in me, you know, I've been here for a while. I've worshiped with you, and we've talked about the truth. And we've talked about how, you know, um, we're, we're supposed to pray, and we're supposed to, you know, have that sermon, and we're supposed to sing those songs, and we're supposed to, you know, praise God and make melody in our hearts and all of that, and I just can't do it without hearing those instruments. And I thought to myself, well, you know that's not right. And we've talked about how that's not right. And we've talked about the, the scripture and what it says about what is right. And he says, I understand all that. He says, but you got to remember, this is what I did for years. This is where I was for years. And he said, it's going to take me some time to do that. We've left there, and I don't know whatever became of it, but I always remember him saying that, that he struggled with it. And it makes me think of this and what these brethren were struggling with. Growing up, having offered those meats to those idols. Growing up, and that's the backdrop. And someone comes along one day and says, look, that's not a thing. That's not the reality that God has in mind for you. And so, they're converted out of that, and they're brought to the right knowledge. They're brought to the right understanding. According to the scripture, according to what Paul taught them, as it was given to Paul by God. But then somewhere along the way, certain brethren within that congregation decided that, hmm, knowledge is the most important thing. And I want you to notice what... Paul says here, it's in the third verse, and he says, look, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know what he ought. In other words, you know, there's an arrogance here. You're drawing from that deeper pool when in actuality you're just picking up pebbles next to the seaside of understanding. Then he goes on, but if anyone loves God, he, know, he is known by God. Now we know about the love of God, don't we? You know, if you love me, keep my commandments, that sort of thing. We, we come to know God through his word, but it's all about the love that we have for him. So we're coupling here the idea of having that knowledge and having that love going hand in hand with one another. These guys had divorced the two. Now I'm a math teacher. So I can't help but make a math example. How many of us remember? Oh, how many of us shiver at the thought of Venn diagrams? Remember these things? Circle A, circle B, intersection, circle C. And then they got real interesting. The union of A, not B, intersection A, not C. And you're like, what? I don't know what that means. But think Venn diagrams here. A, knowledge. B, love. And if in your mind you don't see those two circles crossing over one another to that nice little sweet spot in the middle where everything is in balance, where we have all of the will of God and only the will of God, then we're not going to get it right. See, these guys said, ah, we don't want you. The whole love part, we don't really care about all that. What we care about is the knowledge. They had turned to intellectualism, which is kind of ironic because they took knowledge and they turned it into an idol. It seems. It's so important to them that we don't care who gets hurt by it. 
Now, I find it interesting that, that Paul here approaches the topic in this way, especially because of what happens over in the book of Acts in chapter 15. You remember in Acts 15 where that council meets there in Jerusalem and they have to make some decisions, especially about you know, Gentile brethren? And one of the things that is very clearly said there is don't eat things offered to idols. And then he talks about strangled things and some other things. And so Paul could have come along and said, look, guys, plain field made equal. Nobody eats anything offered to idols. <clears throat> End of story. Done. But he didn't. He didn't. Because you see, knowledge, this intellectualism, this worship at the altar of I know something is their problem. As opposed to the person who is struggling with that. And they take the opportunity to see that brother struggle, to maybe know that brother is struggling, and they throw their stones of intellectualism. When I was a kid, small boy, right? It's hard to picture me as a small boy now. But a small boy, nonetheless, I lived in a place called Key Ridge. It was less of a town than more of a, you know, feature on a map. We had one store and a stop sign. I don't even know what the population was. I'm pretty sure it was me and my family. No, I mean, it's probably more than that. Uh, but it was small. It was small. And across the street uh, from us, there was a woman by the name of Grace. And she was more or less my only neighbor. The next neighbor was about two miles that way. The neighbor on the other side was maybe three miles that way. And we had a garden and a farm and some animals and all of that. But Grace, she had the pasture where the cows grazed. She had the pond where we went fishing for the bluegill. And one day, my dad decided to take us there. And so we go over and we say hi to Grace, who's sitting on the front porch with her terroristic Pomeranians. And we go past and cross right to the fence, behind the barn to the electric fence that's there. And my dad, <clears throat> being kind of the jokester that he was, told us that, you know, you can touch an electric fence and not get shot. And we're like, what, really? Damn, you know, we're kids. She says, yeah, all you have to do is be touching the ground with one hand and have a piece of straw in your mouth at the same time. Now, you know where this is going, right? And so we're like, yes. Never did a piece of straw go from the ground to a boy's mouth quicker than that. Threw that thing out of the mouth, boom, touching the fence, and you know what happens. My brother and I are shocked, and we're falling to the ground, and we're like, what? And why would you do that? And he's laughing his head off, and we go to, over the fence, go down to the pond, and we're fishing for what seems like hours. It's been a minute. You know, but to a boy, that's a long time. No bites. If my bobber hits the water and it's not bobbing within the first minute or two, I'm done. And so after a couple minutes, we resort to skipping rocks. Skipping rocks. And my brother throws one. Uh, I'm going to make it farther. Mine has to go further than his does. So he skips three or four times. I'm going to do five or six times. And we start throwing these rocks harder and harder and harder and harder. And eventually we realize, I can get it all the way across the pond. It's not that big. And so we do. We start seeing who can get it to the other side. And so there's this, sea, not sea, there's this piece of shore that we're looking at, seeing who can get their rock to that little piece of shore on the other side. Who do you think steps into that frame? My father. Steps into the frame of that other side of the pond and we're like, hmm, this is the guy that just shocked us back here at the fence. <laughs> hmm. And my brother, now I'll admit, up until about a day ago, um, my brother never admitted that it was him that did this. I had always thought it was me. I, I was very young at the time, but two days ago in Columbia, Tennessee, when we were visiting with them, he admitted to it that he said, watch this. And he took that rock and he threw it. Now, did you ever have one of those moments where 
you have this picture in your mind of kind of a video reel, and you see it playing out one way, and then it happens and it doesn't look the same. This is not that. He picked up the rock, he took the rock and he threw it and he skipped once, skipped twice, skipped a third and then a fourth time. And on that fourth time, it jumped out of the water and hit my dad dead in the shin. And he screamed and he was yelling and then they had that moment where his eyes met ours. We knew we were in trouble and we knew there was only one thing to do that on the other side of that electric fence where we had just come from was Grace, sitting on her porch, and we ran for Grace. But see, Grace ought to be the default, shouldn't it? And much like those little boys making a really bad decision, sometimes we take the, we take the knowledge that God gives us and we use it as a stone to cast. We use it as something to to hurl. And sometimes I think it's accidental. And sometimes I think it, it, it might just be on purpose. But we use it as a stone to, to cast at, at, at our brethren. And to hurt. See, there is an intellect. There is a knowledge. And that knowledge is important. And Paul tells us that it is. And he goes on and even reveals that knowledge. An idol's nothing. And therefore the meat offered to the idol, eat, that's nothing. And we, we know this. You know this. But don't be arrogant in your knowledge. Don't be puffed up in your knowledge and use that knowledge to set an example that will cause a brother who is struggling with something. And that's the big point. Now, you're not going to leave here today and wonder, hmm, is my Hardy's burger offered to an, an idol? It hasn't been. There may be other things in there you probably shouldn't be eating, <laughs> but you don't have to worry about, you know, being involved in idolatrous worship when you go down to the Hardy's. Now, maybe KFC. I don't know. No, but you don't have to worry about those types of things. But you do need to worry uh, about how we are using what God has given us for our betterment. What God has given us to bring us to maturity. And that is a knowledge of who he is. A knowledge of who his son is. A knowledge of what true deity is. You see, God is sovereign and he's not giving up the throne anytime soon, right? And when we take the knowledge that he has given it to us and we use it for those ill-fated purposes, or we use it for things that are going to be harmful to other Christians. We're not talking about, you know, anything else. We're talking about using it against other Christians, then God has a real problem with that. How do I know that? Because at the end of the chapter, he says, if you cause that brother to violate his conscience, right, he thinks it's wrong to offer, to eat this meat offered to the idol. He sees you sitting in the marketplace and he says, it must not be wrong. And so he violates his conscience. He sins and then you sin, but you'll notice very clearly if you go to the context there. Paul spells it out, and he doesn't pull a single punch about it. In verse 12, he says, Thus sinning against your brothers, wounding their conscience when it is weak. Okay? This is a guy struggling. Right? How many of us know anybody who struggles? I, last time I checked, Paul said things like, all men sin, fall short of the glory of God. John over in 1 John says something kind of like this, if we say we have no sin, we, have a, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. Now he does say that the child of God does not keep on sinning, but we all have those struggles. We all have those things that we are wrestling with. And he says, but look, you're wounding their conscience when it is weak, you you." who supposedly here is the stronger brother, you sin against Christ. At the end of this story, as I pointed out at the beginning, nobody's winning. Both these guys are in this sinful boat, traveling in a direction that 
God certainly doesn't want them to travel. But it all has to do with this kind of intellectual idea that creates within us this tendency to want to worship at the altar of it. But we've got to realize, back to our Venn diagram, that only happens when we divorce it from everything else and allow it to stand on its own. Now, for the sake of being fair, if you took the idea of love and you divorced it from everything else, if you took the idea of love and you divorced it from truth, you would have things like obsession and all these sort of unhealthy things that went along with having no knowledge and yet loving, sacrificing, being benevolent, being all of those things that even the Bible calls us to be, but without knowledge, it, it's unprofitable. And it's still going to take us in a direction that we don't want to go. But the only way we get to where we need to be is when we put those things together. Put those things together. And allow our knowledge to be tempered by our love. When we do that, then we come to the balance, I think, that Paul wants us to. You see, it's the understanding, it's the knowledge tempered by love that will be able to embrace that last verse. Because, see, that last verse seems a little bit radical, doesn't it? There are lots of things throughout the Bible that, at least from the, the vantage point of the world, seem very harsh. They seem very harsh. Things like, you know, love your enemies. Things like pick up your cross daily. In other words, die to yourself daily uh, to follow after, you know, me. Christ would tell his own disciples, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Blessed are you when that happens. And we could go on and on and on. There are some pretty harsh things. And this, is, seems, this too seems to be one of those things. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. You mean I have to give up meat? Though an idol is nothing, and though the meat is nothing, and though there's no defilement whatsoever, except for in that person's head, I've got to give it up? Are you kidding me? That's not love saying that, is it? What is that? What is that? Well, it can be any number of things. But I can guarantee you it's not love. I can guarantee you it's not grace. It's still down there standing on the edge of that pond throwing that rock instead of up there with grace. It's not love. You see, when we couple knowledge with love, then we have exactly the picture God wants us to see. You may think that thought, why? I don't get it. Why is he not getting it? And you don't have to get it. What you have to get is that your brother is struggling with something. Your sister is struggling with something. And see, I think that if we take this to this next step and we start to get real with it, that's where we're going to end up having to tackle some difficult things. Because the truth is, is that sometimes... We take the truth of God's word and we act like it's a stone and we begin to build that ivory tower that we dwell in so that we can look down upon other people who don't know the truth. They say they're woke, but they're asleep, and that's true. But that doesn't give us the right to treat them as if they are not part of God's creation, as if they are not loved by him, As if Christ didn't die for them. It matters how you treat people. Especially people who are struggling. You see, when we use the stones of truth to build walls, 
then we effectively create a barrier to any truthful conversation about things. A brother doesn't feel like he can come to me and say, I'm struggling with this. What do I do? I have this problem and I need help with it. Well, you know what the truth says. Okay, great. They need to know we love them. No, we never pull the punch on the truth. Christ spoke harsh words. We've said that already. One of those contexts is a conversation about you must eat my flesh and drink my blood and they don't understand it. And they begin to grumble and his own disciples tell him, they say, look, this is a hard thing. You know, how can people accept this? How can people follow this? And he turns to them and you remember what he asked? He says, will you go away too? And Peter is the one that stands up and he says, to whom will we go? You have the words of life. And they are. And we can never water them down. We can never add to them. We can never take away with them. But we have to use them in love to bring our brethren who are strong in the faith and make them stronger. Who are struggling in the faith and make them greater. Who are immature in the faith and bring them to maturity not just a lesson about meats. It's a lesson about how you treat your brother. We can build the walls and we can make conversation impossible. We can let them know that we love them and show them the truth and be there for them when they wrestle with the truth. Number two, we can hurt them with the truth rather than serve them with the truth. Paul calls us to be servants. He does it in a number of different ways. My favorite one is over in Philippians chapter 2. I've always loved the fact that Paul writes this book that all throughout it, it's joy, right? Every chapter, joy, rejoice, rejoice, joy. And again, we say rejoice. But it also in every single chapter, it's serve, 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 serve. We can serve. We must have that servant mentality. In the midst of a conversation about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus picks up a towel and goes and washes some feet. He served. And you see, the expectation is for us to do the same. We can build walls, allow people to struggle. We can use truth to hurt, or we can use it to serve. We can use the truth to build up, or we can use it to break down. Paul encourages the latter. If you go back to the first verse, it really is kind of the summation of the entire issue. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Paul says, choose love. Now Paul's going to go several more chapters, and he's going to give this answer in in fuller treatment in chapter 13. And he's going to call it there at the end of chapter 12 the the more excellent way. But he alludes to it here. So you've taken your your knowledge and, and you're doing the same thing with it as you did with the idol and you're worshiping it. You've made it about that one thing. You've elevated it to this point where it's no different than what you, where you were in the past. But you're going to use that to beat up your brother who's still struggling with those things you know, of the past. It's all about that balance of truth and love. Let me give you one last illustration, and the lesson will be yours. Back in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 4, We're told about a time that Israel is going out against the Philistine. I mean, how many times is there, right? I mean, the Philistines seem to be this constant enemy. And so there's a time where they go out and they're they're against them. This is the time of Eli and his sons, those wicked, uh, you know, wicked sons that are, you know, not working in, in conjunction with God and godly things, but working evil. And they go out against the Philistines and they don't win. As a matter of fact, they lose 4,000 people. 
They lose 4,000 people in the battle, and they come back, and they go to the elders, and they ask the elders, you know, why did we lose? Why, why did we not win the battle? And they think about it a little bit, and they struggle with it a little bit, and then they come up with this idea. You know, maybe we didn't win because we did not take, we did not take the Ark of the Covenant with us. And so they go and they get the ark, right? You, you probably remember this story. They go and they get the ark and they take it out into battle. And there's, you know, um, Hophni and Phinehas and they're there and they're going to the battle with the ark and it doesn't do them any good. They still lose. As a matter of fact, they don't just lose. They lose in, in a dramatic way. Eli's sons are killed in the battle along with tens of thousands of guys. I don't know how big Knoxville is in population, but imagine tomorrow morning you woke up and you are now down 34,000 citizens. Wow. That's going to be a big thing, isn't it? And so the ark is taken captive. The ark is taken captive, and they come back and they tell Eli, and they tell him about his sons, and I'm sure he's upset about that, but when they tell him about the ark, he falls off his stool breaks his neck, and he dies. And then we're told about the ark, how it's over there in the hands of the Philistines and it's put in the temple for Dagon and the statue bows down to it. And the people are stricken with this pestilence of tumors. And they don't know what to do, but they're believers. And they're saying, we've got to do something with this ark. So they take the ark and they put it on a cart and they take uh, some gold and other things and they make tumors. They make literal tumors and rats I don't know why rats but they make these things they put them on the ark and they aim it at Jerusalem and send it back or they aim it at you know the Israelites and they go to send it back it doesn't make it there but it's an interesting little story about a people who decided one day that this ark of the covenant where God was supposed to dwell was the thing that would win the day for them. Their understanding of it. See, they didn't go to God and ask him, God, why are we losing? Why, why, why did we lose the 4,000 men? They didn't do that. They went to the elders. And even when the elders came up with something, they never went to God. And they literally say in, in the context, 1 Samuel 4, 3, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant uh, of the Lord from Shiloh that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. The whole of their belief system was not in God. The whole of their love was not in God. It was in that ark and thus destined to fail. That's the danger of the whole one thing mentality. You know, I know Paul says this one thing I do and then he goes on to describe that looking at Christ keeping his eye on that prize, describing the whole of Christianity. But you can't elevate one thing and somehow think that God is going to do that. We can't elevate even something as vital as baptism. Baptism. It's all about baptism. Once you get to baptism, you're good. Nope. Not true. There are things that come before it. There's a lot that comes after it. But at the end of the day, it's all about how we treat our brother. Do we take the knowledge that God has given us of these things that begin with him, the fact that he is light, the fact that he is life, the fact that he is love, and do we use them for the betterment of not only our own lives but the lives of our fellow saints? Or do we use them in ways that hurt them? Because we're just not doing it with love. We're just not doing it to serve. We're just not doing it with a sense of empathy in our heart that sees that person and thinks, maybe they've got something going on. First lecture I listened to, I can't remember what the brother's name was, but he talked about this. He talked about how there, there have been brethren that, you know, who seem to be stalwarts of the Christian community, uh, only they failed. And we sit there and we wonder as to what happened. Rest, rest assured, it didn't happen overnight. 
And maybe we don't know because we have no business knowing. But maybe we should have known and we just didn't because we just didn't have it in our hearts to be empathetic, to be sympathetic, to, to have that compassion that would look at a crowd and be moved because they didn't have food and compare that to them being lost without a shepherd, like Jesus did. Final passage and lesson is yours. Matthew chapter 25. If you remember, it's that section of scripture that talks about judgment. And just as easy as it is for us to tell the difference between a sheep and a goat, the crowd will be divided on that day. And the sheep will be on the right hand and the goats will be on the left. And we remember the destination for both. The sheep that are followers and hear the voice of the shepherd, they're going to hear those words, come on in. There's glory that's waiting for you. And Christ had promised those, that house with many mansions and many dwelling places, and you're going to come and you're going to be with me, come on in. But then you remember the goats, the stubborn, the hard-headed, heart of heart, cast into that place that's reserved for, not man, Satan and his angels. Because God wants all men to be saved, but some men won't choose it. But all of that context that's between those two ideas we realize this is exactly what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 8. How you treat Christ by how you treat people. How did you treat the brothers? Did you see one struggling and help him out? Or did you do things that would make him go further into sin? Did you see me naked? Did you see me unclothed? Did you see me hungry? Did you see me, you know, and we could put, we could make that list long, couldn't we? As much as you did or did it not to one of them, you did or did not do it to me, he says. How we treat our brothers can make the difference in our eternity. Thank you. Ed, thank you for obviously your message, but also your heart. And I, at some point, probably in my preaching career, I'm probably going to have to steal the grace and rock story, you know. Um, but I'll give you credit. I'll be like, it wasn't me. It was Ed Benish. Uh, and his brother. Um, we have, I think, lunch now. Uh, and then at 1.30, uh, there will be, uh, here in the auditorium, it's one lecture at 1.30. Uh, Stephen Knoll uh, will be tackling uh, the impossible task of the baptism for the dead from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Uh, and so you may, you may find that to be um, uh, something you're certainly interested in. And also, we'll go ahead and plug registration again. If you have uh, meandered in here today and you have not registered, please go ahead and do that. Fill out that sheet. Go ahead and get you one of these right here as well. Um, but I certainly hope you have a good meal and hope to see you back at 1.30. Thank you. You are dismissed.